coming all the way from Maine, so I definitely want to congratulate her for all the drive. It wasn't easy. But it's not as far as Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Susan is founder and CEO of Sarah Helix, and she has 20 years in material science. She works in corporate R&D at 3M Corporation. She holds a PhD in chemistry mm -hmm. and from the University of North Carolina. And she was also a mass high tech woman to watch in 2011. Right. So yeah. we're honored to have her presentation and let's give her a hand clap. Thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, as she said, my name is Susan McKay. I'm the CEO of Sarah Helix. Sarah Helix is the company that's actually developing the technology on which this moonshot is based. So let's assume you've actually taken the moonshot. So you're looking back at the Earth. And from this vantage point, you'd be hard pressed to say that there's an actual water crisis happening on this planet. However, for those of us who know better, only 3% of the water on the Earth is actually usable by humans, and that's the fresh water. And in addition, less than 1% of the fresh water on the planet is actually accessible to humans. The rest is locked up in the ice caps and under the soil. So it's all about your point of view and where you are and how you interact with this, with this problem. So here is a photo from Maine. This is actually in my neighborhood. And, and where I live, I don't actually view water as being a scarce resource. But if I were to live at the mouth of the Colorado River, I'd have a very different perspective. And water scarcity would be very real to me. And so this goes to not just water scarcity, but water stress. There's actually a plenty of fresh water in the United States, but there are towns in the US that have run out of water. And there's many cities that are on the verge of running out of fresh water resources. And this is known as water stress. And currently, a third of the world's population is experiencing water stress. And in 10 years, that number will be two thirds of the world's population. <clears throat> So what's behind the idea of water stress is the principle of the water energy nexus. And that is due to the fundamental interaction of these two critical resources that we have, water and energy. And a lot of the stress is because the water treatment and the way we distribute fresh water was all built on technology that was developed more than 60 years ago at a time when energy was plentiful. And people really didn't think about the impacts of how we treated or um, distributed water based on how much energy it consumed. It really wasn't a problem. There was plenty of cheap energy available. But in reality, um, the same can be said of energy production. Um, power plants and the energy producers consume a lot of our freshwater resources. And that's because these technologies were optimized independently of each other. So water filtration was developed independent of thinking about how much energy it takes to purify water. And energy production was developed without thinking of the impact on water resources. For instance, fracking, which is one of the big innovations in energy production today, it's an, it actually spent more than 10 years developing it, uses a tremendous amount of freshwater resources. Over a 20-month period in the last two years, the U.S. fracking industry consumed more than 65 billion gallons of fresh water to pump oil and gas out of the ground. This is what's driving this industry as well as others to look at water reuse and recycling technology. And this is the industry which we are working with initially at Sierra Helix. And what we've identified is that if you use the original water purifica purification filters that were developed um, 60 years ago, while they can provide the high purity needed to recycle water, they're not very durable. They operate in a narrow range of, of operating conditions. So it's hard to apply them to all the different types of water treatment people are trying to do now to recycle water. And you can look at ceramic membranes or ceramic materials. They're very durable, but they don't offer the same high purity that the polymer filters did. And so at Siri Helix, we're looking at the intersection of these two needs, how to make a very durable filter that filters at high purity so it can be widely deployed and help us reuse and recycle water. So here's an example of what we looked at first. So we were trying to make a more higher purity ceramic filter. We chose ceramics because of their durability. The way most ceramic filters work is you take very small ceramic particles and you fuse them together. And the path between them then is the channel that they use to filter. And so for ceramics to get smaller and smaller, you need to make smaller and smaller nanoparticles. That's how you make higher purity ceramic filters. At Sierra Helix, we approached it differently. We looked at ceramics in more of their glass state, and so it's more like a liquid. And we incorporated DNA into this liquid, and then we applied heat. And the heat then hardened the ceramic and removed the DNA in a single step. 
And in this way, we were able to produce a filter that was, had significantly narrower pores compared to the smallest nanoceramic filters that are currently being developed. So our filters are less than a nanometer. They're also incredibly thin. So we deposit our ceramic material as a very thin top layer on top of, of ceramic filters that exist already, and providing a 10x improvement in their filtration purity. And if you see here, all the ceramic behind our membrane material has the little ball shapes that I showed before. That's the more typical ceramic filter. And the very top layer, which is ours, looks physically very different in this very high resolution picture. And so that kind of shows you that materially, it's a very different type of material. And we can't actually see in that picture the actual holes. So we sort of, and we, we can get at that information by looking at how this material absorbs. So here's an absorption graph of our material with the DNA in it. We then heat it up, removing the DNA, and then we can see evidence of the less than nanometer size pores that are left behind. And being less than a nanometer then means that the Cirahelix technology can now push ceramic filters into further down the spectrum of purity and their ability to remove dissolved contaminants in water. And this is the first time a ceramic filter would be able to do this type of high-end purification. And so then it's looking at very significant things like salts and sugars, things that are actually dissolved in water. And this also includes a lot of man-made contaminants in the water as well. So here are some examples of data from our prototype filters. It shows that they're very durable. They can be cleaned very aggressively and reused over a long lifetime, up to 10 years. And it's also a very high purity. So the, the bottom graph shows that we can filter down below a very small molecular size. So that's indicative of, again, the, the less than a nanometer size pores. So taking all this together, high durability and high purity, is, builds out a platform technology. Not only can we clean up fracking water, so that it can be reused and recycled. But we can apply to a, a range of different industries with this technology. And what we see is the real growth and potential of this technology is that it can be used for point of use water purification. And that's where it's really optimal. So the older types of filters, the polymer filters, they, need to, they work optimally at the big, large water treatment plants where they're being run 24 seven round the clock, always pressurized. Our rigid ceramic filters work better in point of use. And so we have the ability to take the same technology and do on-site water treatment, not only at, at oil fields or at, power, you know, at, at um, different types of industries, but actually in communities as well. So as we get away from the very energy intensive way of um, treating water centrally and then pumping and piping it around, you can actually treat on-site. And so it's a much more energy efficient way to treat water. And, and it sort of treats, so we've developed a filter for that water energy nexus. There's, there's so much more to this than just, it's just a better filter. And it's just that it, it needs so much less resources ahead of it to get the, you know, a lot of the current technology, people are trying to shoehorn in technology that already exists and make it work in like, for instance, in the oil fields. But it's really difficult. You have to control every, you have to add a lot of chemicals and you have to do a lot of pretreatment before it hits that filter, otherwise the filter fails. And so we are, we're more cost effective. It costs between two and $20 per barrel of oil to treat the water that you're producing in the oil and gas example. And our technology reduces that cost to less than a dollar. So it's that cost savings and it's a sum of less energy, more throughput, as well as less pretreatment. And all that combined makes it a more efficient um, filter technology. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you. Um, can you speak to this technology's applications in the desalination industry? Will it be beneficial to that industry? <clears throat> Yeah, for desalination, we actually are already um, have some applications in that space. We ourselves are not a desalination membrane. That's not we. That's a very um, specific type of membrane that works in that space. But to be, what we can do is improve the overall energy efficiency of removing salts from water to the purity of drinking water. So we actually enable that industry and right. reduce the costs and energy cost. Thank you. And could you speak to where you get the DNA from and why DNA? DNA for us is a generic material. We use it for its shape and its structure. It's a very rigid polymer, so it can form the nice straight channels that we want. It's cheap and readily available in its natural form. We have used oligos 
as well as natural sourced DNA, um, highly purified DNA that we then, we basically um, will get it to the right length and purity for our recipe is what we call it. So we actually, um, one of our sources of DNA is a byproduct of the aquaculture industry from fish blood. So we take highly purified DNA from fish blood and that's what we use to make our product. So we take that DNA, we purify it, we make it the length we want. And then the reason we like DNA besides it being straight and linear is it can form the very small pores because it interacts with the ceramic. And it also self-assembles. DNA is a very unique mo molecule, and, and we, can we can use that to get it to order itself. So we get the channels, we get you know, areas of order in our filter. And that's one of the reasons it's um, more energy efficient as a filter, too. So. Cool.